10 o'clock. Fantastic. Then at 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock Singapore, 10 o'clock London. Good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are. Um, it looks like we have got an enormous amount of um, participants. Um, it is coming up to the 400 mark already. So welcome to every jurisdiction from where you're watching us. This is the uh, joint event with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators London branch and the Singapore branch. And uh, I am thrilled that we finally managed to have a joint event um, online, which is fantastic because we've collaborating for such a long time. And uh, Sapna Jangdiani, as the chair of the Singapore branch, um, is um, always um, very open to um, new ideas, etc. So it's fantastic. We love working with you. And um, for those who do not know the uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, we are sort of the uh, leading international um, body on dispute resolution, in particular with qualifications and training. And so we also have, uh, like um, for student members, uh, I just like to point out that we have a student member category, which is free for students. So we always encourage students to um, join our association, our institute, um, because there are so many events that we organize both online and also in person in all the different jurisdictions. And not only about arbitration, but because we're covering the topic of mediation today, of course, uh, on mediation, but also adjudication. So um, have a look and um, um, see what is out there. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, of course, has um, also got their own mediation rules which you can easily find on the website. I will put the link in the chat uh, a little bit later, if you like. And um, uh, also um, a look at it. Uh, we've been a great supporter um, to um, assist the government um, in their consultation for um, uh, joining the um, Singapore Convention of Mediation. And that is, of course, the topic we are covering today. And uh, I can um, happily report, but I don't want to go too far into um, the speaker's content, but that the UK has decided to join the uh, Singapore Convention for Mediation because it has always been an issue in international um, dispute settlement agreements, the enforceability, and so far there's only been the arbitration that has been enforceable through the New York Conventions. But uh, the Singapore Convention is a great initiative to also make sure that settlements will be enforceable internationally. So a fantastic step forward. Um, this, uh, this is wonderful. And I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing from all the stellar panelists that we have, which Shobana Aya, one of our uh, London branch committees, will introduce. And a particular thank you from my side to Shobana for um, initiating this and um, organizing it, getting it off the ground. Um, and uh, also um, for the um, Secretariat of the Singapore branch. And the Singapore branch has put a lot of effort and um, sponsorship into this as well. So very many thanks for that. And um, I think I just hand over to Sapna now and wish everybody a fantastic hour and 15 minutes or perhaps an hour and a half. Let's see how long we go. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karina. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you uh, here today. As Karina mentioned, this is the first collaboration between CIOB Singapore Branch and CIOB London Branch. Hopefully it will be the first of many. It's very exciting for us and it's particularly personally rewarding to see all the many discussions that Karina and I have had about collaborating come to fruition today. I endorse everything Karina has said about CIR being a leading uh, training provider in alternative dispute resolution and also having fellowship and other tiers of accreditation which are recognized all over the world. Delighted to hear that uh, a thousand participants registered for today's event. I think we had to cut off at a thousand, would you believe? And I think that reflects the very high caliber of expert speakers that we have today, and also the huge importance of today's topic and the worldwide interest in it. It's an important topic for our branch, for the London branch, and 
all dispute resolvers around the world and anyone who even uses dispute resolution. Um, and no doubt that reflects the great interest that we've seen uh, in today's event. Um, I don't want to keep our audience any longer from the fascinating discussion that we're all lo looking forward to. So with that, I shall hand over to Shobna Ayer. Can I also record my thanks to her for initiating, arranging and moderating today's event and to our secretariat. So over to you, Shobna. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sapna and Karina. I mean, London and Singapore are my two favourite jurisdictions. <laughs> so it was wonderful to have this collaboration, particularly when we found out um, from the Bar Council of England and Wales, when we found out that the government was actually going to ratify it and sign it. So it all got me very excited. And I have some eminent uh, speakers here on this panel to, um, to make sure that you get um, an insightful and enjoyable session uh, in, in this uh, working, uh, in this seminar itself. So we know that the um, United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements resulting from mediation is known as the Singapore Convention. Now I put, uh, hopefully you've all read it beforehand because it's been sent, but for those the link is there mentioned on the in the chat itself. Um, but it establishes a uniform framework for effective recognition and enforcement of commercial mediated agreements uh, across borders. And the primary goal of the Singapore Convention is to facilitate international trade and promote the use of mediation for the resolution of cross-border commercial disputes. And that you can see from the UNCTRL's uh, uh, accession uh, kit, which I will also uh, put the link down in the chat in a minute. Um, so the intention is to have a uniform and efficient framework for the enforcement of international settlement agreements uh, resulting from mediation and allowing parties to invoke such agreement aching to the framework uh, that the Convention on the Recognition of Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, that's a New York Convention, provides for um, arbitral awards. Um, so essentially we are going to go a little bit more deeper in here, uh, apart from just um, dealing with the New York Convention, I mean the Singapore Convention, um, we are going to go and uh, with, with my eminent speakers, um, let me introduce my eminent speakers first of all. So we have Robert Rhodes Casey, uh, is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, he's an accredited media mediator, uh, as well as an arbitrator. He was a, for, he was a former member of the Bar Council of England and Wales um, and the Master of the Bench for the Honourable Society of Inner Temple. He was appointed Queen's Council in 1989, uh, was a part-time judge for 35 years and has presided over numerous regulatory panels. He is a member of many arbitration and mediation panels worldwide, including England, mainland China, Hong Kong, Japan, New York and the Caribbean. Um, he is a member of the mediation panel of the Court of Arbitration of Sports, that's CAS Arbitrations, um, and also a member of the mediation panel of the Court of Arbitration for Art in Netherlands. He is also an adjunct pro uh, professor uh, for the Institute of Dispute Resolution and Risk Management um, at Hong Kong, and he has lectured worldwide on arbitration and mediation matters, including the Singapore Convention and mediation. Uh, Robert will start off by providing a kind of overview of the New York Convention, and then we will go to Michelle Calipitas Casey. Um, Michelle also is um, well known in the mediation field. He, he was a former head of Littleton Chambers and since 2006 a door tenant of Quadrant Chambers. Michelle is recognised in all the legal directories uh, as an expert in the field of mediation, commercial litigation and professional negligence. He is an accredited mediator uh, with CEDA and ADR Chambers was appointed to the Hong Kong uh, International Arbitration Centre's accredited mediation panel and is one of the first uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Mediation Fellows in 2008. He was appointed to the Singapore International Mediation Center and the International Panel, I say International Panel of Mediators in 2014. He's a member of the Sports uh, Resolution Panel. And I could go on and on, but I think more important than that, he was in, he started off the Bar Council of Link England's ADR uh, panel back um, 
uh, and was in that position for uh, nine years uh, until he re retired from that position in summer 20, uh, 2008. Um, he is still a member of, uh, he's still, although he doesn't share it, we do have him on that group and he did actually do a lot uh, at, at drafting the response for the Bar Council uh, at the um, UK's response to the um, consultation which came out. And it was in March this year that we found out that the UK um, gave their commitment um, to ratify the um, New York Convention. And of course, it was signed on. Um, it's it's been uh, ratified and signed, up, but it's it's still in the in the process, obviously. Um, and on on earlier this month, we've just had the. Um, on, on this uh, on the um third of may it was signed um but now we have to get it into force and i think that's good. that's the next stage um so essentially we'll have michelle dealing with the kind of very controversial insightful issues and that will be followed by eunice uh, looking at it from the singapore perspective and eunice Chowler, um she's a fellow of the chartered institute of arbitrate uh, arbitrators. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Financial Industry Dis uh, Disputes Resolution Centre, a non-for-profit company uh, providing mediation and adjudication to uh, consumers for disputes against licensed financial institutions. Before that, Eunice was an Assistant Professor at the Singapore Management University School for Law, where she specialised in alternative dispute resolution evidence and procedure. She remains a research fellow at the Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy. She is a principal mediator and trainer for the Singapore Mediation Centre and a member of the board of directors for the Chartered Institute uh, Singapore branch. Previously, Yunis was a justice's law clerk and an assistant registrar at the Supreme Court of Singapore. She was also an assistant director of the Singapore Mediation Centre and a Deputy CEO of the Singapore International Mediation Centre, um, which I know um, uh, Michelle is also uh, a mediator at. Now, if I can now turn the stage over to Robert to give the overview of the um, Singapore Convention. <laughs> so Robert, would you like to take over? Thank you, Shobana. It's both a privilege and a pleasure have been invited to talk about the Singapore Convention at this webinar. Thank you for inviting me and thank you also for attending. And I must say it's a particular honour to be on this panel with such distinguished fellow members. The New York Convention of 1958 was a game changer for international arbitration because it enabled arbitral awards made in one state to be enforced in any other state that was a party to the, con to the convention. And at the moment, more than 170 states have uh, signed and ratified that convention. It is hoped that the Singapore Convention on Mediation will do for international commercial mediation what the New York Convention did for international arbitration. Prior to the Singapore Convention, it could be a time-consuming and expensive process to seek to enforce a mediation settlement in a third country. For example, if the EU Mediation Directive of 2008 did not apply, you had to go through a terribly long process. First of all, the party seeking to enforce it would have to sue on it in the original country, They'd have to obtain a judgment, and then try to enforce that judgment in the third country. Alternatively, it could try to transform the settlement into an arbitral award, in which case it would seek to enforce it under the New York Convention. The Singapore Convention, however, introduces an efficient, practical and harmonised framework for cross-border enforcement of settlement agreements resulting from commercial mediation. The demand for the Convention, as you might expect, 
came from business because of the problems I've just mentioned of enforcement of settlement agreements in third countries. And businesses have indicated that such a convention would make them more likely to use mediation in the first place. Its full name is United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements Resulting from Mediation. It's known as the Singapore Convention on Mediation because it was, it was in Singapore that it was uh, signed. Originally, the word conciliation was used in the title, but that was uh, subsequently changed to mediation. I come now to the convention, and let's start with some relevant dates. The first date is the 20th of December 2018. And that's when the United Nations adopted the convention by resolution 73 stroke 198. The resolution specifically recognized the value of mediation as a method of amicably settling disputes arising in the context of international commercial relations. On the 7th of August, 2019, 46 countries signed the, the convention. On the 12th of September, 2020, the convention came into force. That being six months after the deposit of the third instrument of ratification and under Article 14. Now, the first thing to consider is what the convention does not apply to. It does not apply to settlement agreements. First, that were concluded to resolve a dispute arising from transactions engaged in by one of the parties, a consumer, for personal, family, or household purposes nor does it apply to settlements relating to family, inheritance, or employment law. So if, for example, there's a dispute over will that's resolved by a, a mediation settlement agreement, that will not be covered by the convention. It doesn't apply to settlement agreements that have been approved by a court or concluded in the course of proceedings before court and are enforceable as a judgment in the state of that court. And it doesn't apply to settlement agreements that are enforceable as an arbitral award. You'd have to rely upon the New York Convention for that. Well, what does it apply to? An agreement resulting from mediation concluded in writing by the parties to resolve a commercial dispute, which when concluded was international. And I'll take those different elements one by one. What is mediation? Well, there's a standard definition of mediation which should all be familiar, and so I need not go into it today. What is in writing? Well, a settlement is in writing if its content is recorded in any form. So ink and paper can be in writing. You can't know what's meant by that. But in writing doesn't have to be ink and paper. An electronic communication will do, provided the information contained therein is accessible so as to be usable for subsequent reference. For the purposes of the convention, a settlement agreement is international if at least two parties to the agreement have their places of business in different states, or the state in which the parties to the agreement have their places of business is different from either the state in which a substantial part of the obligation under the agreement is performed. So for example, you've got your places of business in England and 
the the, the uh, obligations are to be performed in Germany, or it's different from the state with which the subject matter of the settlement agreement is most closely connected. Well, you might ask, what if a party has more than one place of business? In that case, the relevant place of business is that which has the closest relationship to the dispute resolved by the settlement agreement, having regard to the circumstances known to or contemplated by the parties at the time of the conclusion of the settlement agreement. But then what if a party doesn't have a place of business? In that case, reference is made to the party's habitual place of residence. And what are the main responsibilities of the parties to the convention? These are stated in Article 3. Each party to the convention, so you're not talking about the parties to the settlement agreement in question, but the parties, the states, the convention, shall enforce a settlement agreement in accordance with its rules of procedure and under the conditions laid down in the convention. Well, that brings you on to the next question. How do you actually enforce a settlement agreement under the convention? Under Article 4, the party seeking to enforce it must supply quite a bit of documentation to the competent authority of the state where it's seeking relief. First, it must supply the settlement agreement signed by the parties. Secondly, it must provide evidence that the settlement agreement resulted from mediation. This can be, for example, the mediator's signature on the settlement agreement or a document signed by the mediator indicating that the mediation was carried out. This could be, for example, the mediator signed a uh, receipted fee note. It could be an attestation by the institute that administered the mediation. And helpfully, there's a catch-all provision. In the absence of any of the above, any other evidence acceptable to the competent authority. An example of this, of course, could be emails between the parties referring to the conclusion of the settlement agreement. And the signature by the parties to the, or the mediator can be electronic, provided certain conditions are met. Well, what if the convention, as the settlement agreement rather, is not in an official language of the party to the convention where relief is sought? For example, an Italian settlement agreement sought to be enforced in the PRC after ratification of the convention. Well, in that case, the, the competent authority may simply request a translation of the settlement agreement. And the competent authority may require any necessary document to verify that the convention's requirements have been complied with. What is particularly important is Article 4.5, which provides that when considering the request for relief, the competent authority shall act expeditiously. This is mandatory, shall, not discretionary, may, or is expected to. And this is very important because not all countries deal with legal matters particularly promptly. And the last thing anybody seeking to enforce a settlement agreement in a third country wants is to have perhaps years of delay in seeking to enforce it. How do you resist enforcement under the convention? As with the New York Convention, there are various defenses to enforcement. 
And in respect of the Singapore Convention on Article 5, there are eight possible defenses. The first six specifically put the burden of proof on the party seeking to resist enforcement. In all eight cases, it is a matter of discretion and not entitlement for the competent authority not to enforce the agreement. The wording throughout is may refuse to enforce it, not shall refuse. Time doesn't permit me today to go through uh, any of these grounds in any, any sort of detail, but I can summarize them very briefly as follows. First, incapacity, example, uh, minor. Secondly, deficiencies or subsequent modification of the settlement agreement itself. Thirdly, performance or lack of clarity or comprehensibility of the settlement agreement. Fourthly, granting relief would be contrary to the terms of the settlement agreement. The fifth and sixth grounds for the brainchild are my distinguished colleague, Michelle, and I'm sure that he'll be able to answer questions about them, and I look forward to his discussion of them. Those grounds relate to the mediator himself and involve serious breaches of standards of conduct or serious lack of disclosure by the mediator. The last two grounds echo Article 5.2 of the New York Convention, albeit in reverse order. The seventh ground for non-enforcement is that granting relief would be contrary to the public policy of the state where enforcement is sought. The final ground is that the subject matter of the dispute is not capable of settlement by mediation under the law of the state where enforcement is sought. So it would be sensible for a party contemplating the possibility of having to enforce such a settlement agreement through the convention to define the remedies for breach of the settlement agreement in that agreement. But some remedies aren't available under the laws of certain countries. So in defining remedies, the parties should consider where they'd be likely to enforce the agreement and what remedies are available there. One such example would be if the settlement agreement referred to the payment of interest, but enforcement were sought in a country that applied Sharia law, which of course prohibits the payment of interest. Well, I hope I haven't made your flesh creep by pointing out the potential pitfalls in enforcement. But in fact, they may well not be as prominent as in enforcement of arbitral awards under the New York Convention. And I say this for three reasons. The first is that the whole ethos of mediation is founded upon the desire of the parties to come to an acceptable settlement. And this differs from arbitration where one party is determined to get as much as they can from the other party, while the other party is determined to make life as difficult as possible for the first party. Secondly, matters that are very much to the forefront of parties' minds in mediation are things such as saving time and expense by settling. And also, and this is very important in the commercial field, in maintaining the relationship with the other party. For example, if you want to continue selling your ships to the other side in the future, it's not going to make the other party over eager to trade with you if its lawyer calls you a thief and a liar in cross-examination in the course of arbitration or litigation. And thirdly, whereas losers in arbitral proceedings 
do quite often seek to resist enforcement of the award. Parties who have signed a mediation settlement agreement are usually only too happy to have settled the dispute. And although it does happen, it's unusual for one party subsequently to seek to resolve an agreement he has signed with the benefit of legal advice. Under Article 6, that if there's a parallel application or claim which might affect the relief sought for enforcement under Article 4, the decision on the Article 4 application may be adjourned and the enforcing state can order one party to give suitable security. Article 8 provides for reservations. There are only two reservations that a party to the Convention can give. The first is not to apply the Convention to settlement, to settlement agreements which it or any governmental agency, etc., as a party, to the extent specified in that declaration, in that and Belarus, Georgia, Iran, Kazakhstan, and Saudi Arabia have made that reservation. The second reservation is only to apply the convention to the extent that the parties to the settlement agreement have agreed to the application of the convention. Georgia and Kazakhstan, which have both signed and ratified the convention, and Iran, which has signed but not yet ratified, have made this reservation. So if you're thinking of possibly having to rely on the convention, it'd be sensible to state within the agreement that the parties agree that the convention applies to it. Both these reservations can be withdrawn on six months' notice. And the next question is, to which settlement agreements, in terms of dates signed, does the Convention apply? Now, you might think that you could enforce a settlement agreement under the Convention, irrespective of when it was made, but you'd be wrong. Article 9 provides that the Convention only applies to settlement agreements concluded after the date when the convention enters into force for the party to the convention concerned. So if a country signs and ratifies the convention in 2023, settlement agreements made before then could not be enforced there under the convention, even in, if enforcement were sought after the, that country's ratification. Well, what about withdrawal from the convention? What if a country thought, well, we've had a couple of years of experience with this and it's not working for us, we don't want it. Well, the convention isn't like the Eagles song, California Hotel, where you could check out any time you like, but you could never leave. Ratifying states can indeed leave by giving not less than 12 months notice during which time the Convention continues to apply to settlement agreements concluded before the withdrawal takes effect. So if a state gives 12 months notice of withdrawal on the 1st of January one year, and a settlement agreement is concluded on the 1st of July of that year, it will still be subject to enforcement in that state under the Convention as the state's withdrawal has not taken effect. Now, there are various other provisions of the convention, but I need not deal with them today because they're unlikely to have any practical relevance to you in your practices. How many states have signed and ratified the convention? Well, only 11 have actually ratified it at the 21st of June, 2020, but today. They include Singapore, but 56 states, amounting to over half the world's population, including China, India, and the USA, have signed the convention. And it's also important to bear in mind the following two points. First, that mediation 
need not have been conducted in a country that is a signatory to the convention. Secondly, if the country of the party against which you are seeking to enforce the settlement agreement hasn't ratified the convention, you can still enforce the agreement against assets the party has in a country that has ratified, subject to the second reservation point I've mentioned. What about the convention's relevance to the UK? Well, as you've heard, the UK signed convention some six weeks ago on the 3rd of May. Michelle will be dealing with this and its slightly effect. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Robert. Um, now I'm going to turn over to Michelle. So Michelle, you're going to really deal with the defences and particularly because you were the member of the Incentral Working Group too, which drafted the Singapore Convention and in particular the contentious defences of Section 5, 1, E and F relating to the mediators. Uh, involvement. So, yes. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you, Robert, for a, a, an admirable, clear explanation of the principles of the Singapore Convention. Um, the last point you mentioned, the opt in or opt out provisions, are the source of much argument, particularly between those who wanted it to be an opt out so that it automatically applied to any agreement, and those who said no parties should choose. But the, each country ratifying has, as you point out, the option of deciding whether it's going to be an opt-in or an opt-out. Let me turn to how I get involved. I got involved in the working groups. I had a call from the Canadian delegate Alan Stitt, who's one of my trainers in the ADR group, who said, Michelle, the UK is not represented in this working group. Nobody here knows anything about mediation and they are thinking it's arbitration. Could you possibly come over as a UK representative? Well, the MOJ thought that I wasn't suitable, so they sent their own civil servants who were constrained by the edict from number 10, Downing Street, the government, that as we were still part of the EU, albeit that the option had been elected on, sorry, the population had decided to opt out of Europe. They were bound by the EU line, and the EU line was against the convention. So that was one of the tensions that was readily apparent. But when I got to Vienna, uh, I listened for a day, and it's quite apparent that very few people there knew what mediation was about. I was attacked in a particular conference by a speaker who was very eminent, who said that the whole document resembled the New York Convention and was redolent of arbitration rather than mediation. He focused in particular on Article 5 and the defences to enforcement and said that these are these are opposite to setting aside an arbitral award and nothing to do with mediation at all. But at first blush, uh, he might have been right. And the reason was that the working group started from the premise that they wanted to emulate the provisions of the New York Convention for arbitration by providing a mechanism, as Robert has admirably described, for the enforcement of international commercial settlements agreements. And the important thing to remember when looking at the convention is the following. First, all conventions come together on compromise. Compromise between different delegates' instructions from their respective governments, as though it has to be in the convention. And the defences was one of those issues where certain delegates had been specifically instructed by their government. There must be a defences against mediator impartiality, sorry, lack of impartiality or failure to disclose. There was a fairly robust discussion in Vienna uh, when I was there as to whether any protection was necessary. The experienced mediators pointed out that the working group was dealing with international commercial mediations, where the disputants were invariably represented by teams of lawyers and experts. And the possibility that anything a mediator might do or say could possibly interfere with a consensual agreement reached between those parties when they were represented by lawyers and experts. Furthermore, once the delegates got over the idea that the mediator wasn't deciding anything, 
they then were faced with this proposition. Most international disputes, when they are settled, the lawyers who value their reputation and their clients' goodwill make sure that the settlement agreement provides the mechanism for fulfilling the parties' respective obligations. Safeguards are always built in to these agreements for the transfer of property. So, for example, if it's a share sale, money does not transfer until the shares come over. There'll be a simultaneous transfer. Similarly with property or any other right that's going to be a matter of the subject of the agreement, there's provision made by the lawyers if they know what they're doing, and most of them do, uh, to make sure that there's no disadvantage to their respective client by the other side reneging on a part of the deal once they had got their own bit of it for themselves. And lastly, all respectable lawyers in international disputes provide for the jurisdiction for the enforcement of the settlement. And thus, in response to the delegate from Switzerland who said, do we need it? My candid answer was, we don't actually in reality. But the pressure was there and the pressure from the business community to have a recognized convention. And so we all left Vienna with a grudging realization that we'd have to deal in New York with the desires of various delegates to make sure there were safeguards that protected people who had reached a settlement where a mediator had somehow interfered with their consent to the settlement. Well, for me, New York started with a, a sobering stroll past Trump Tower on my way to the United Nations, down by the river, beautiful views. And um, there's a very fierce debate about these defenses. Experienced mediators warned about settlers' remorse and how we should not make it very easy. There was a strongly argued suggestion that the party seeking to set aside a mediated settlement agreement should be entitled to reopen all the issues in the mediation as if it was a trial. On Wednesday, we got to the basis that we had to draft these defenses. And I put a draft on the table for people to consider. Thursday morning, when I opened my hotel curtains, the place was white. A snowstorm had hit New York. It was completely whited out. Everything stopped and the United Nations was closed. So there'd be no business that day. But the Canadian delegate persuaded a colleague of his who had offices in New York to open up the offices to allow as many delegates as possible to get there to continue our discussions. And so we all went off to these offices and all sat in the boardroom. Now, if any of you have been to a United Nations working group, you'll realize that it takes place usually in an enormous room with row upon row of circles, each delegate having a little area, I used to call it their castle, where the delegates sat surrounded by the secretaries and advisors. And they never moved out of it, except our very experienced a chairperson, Natalie Morris Sharma from Singapore, very cannily had frequent breaks to allow what she called a discussion. And people broke away from their councils, gathered around a coffee, gathered around just to talk about issues on a private basis. And that's where much of the work was done. In addition, although my initial taking part in that discussion was rebuffed by a particular delegate from the EU who said, well, you're leaving us anyway, so what's it to do with you? Which um, I pointed out wasn't exactly what her mediation was all about. It also took taking the EU delegates out for dinner at a Romanian restaurant to persuade them that perhaps uh, we were meaning well. And so we drafted, sitting around the table, the delegates began to share with each other their briefs from their governments. It became effectively not a negotiation, which is what the working group was, but a mediation. 
where people sat together, shared sandwiches, which the Secretariat had thoughtfully provided, and discussed the issues. And one delegate even said, look, Michelle, this is what my instructions are for my government. I have got to somehow fulfill them. The breakthrough came when everybody recognized that there had to be a realization that if the defenses were going to mean anything at all, they could only relate to an alleged behavior or failure by the mediator, which vitiated the consent of the party wishing to set aside the settlement. And that's why if you look at the two sections, section 1E refers to a serious breach by the mediator of standards applicable to the mediator or the mediation. And these are the important words, without which breach, that party would not have entered into the settlement agreement. Or turning to 1F, there was a failure by the mediator to disclose to the parties circumstances that raise, and these are the important words, justifiable doubts as to the mediator's impartiality or independence. And and not all, and such failure to disclose had a material impact or undue influence on a party, without which failure that party would not have entered into the agreement. Now those words were chosen with care because they raise hurdles for any person seeking to resile from a settlement. First hurdle, the alleged breach or failure must be material. You'll be staggered by the hypothetical situations put forward by some delegates. What if the mediator's pension fund had taken over a subsidiary of one of the parties and you didn't know it? I mean, quite bizarre. But what they all failed to appreciate, and happily they accepted the drafting without really recognizing the difficulty is it with an international commercial dispute where the parties are represented by teams of lawyers and experts, which lawyer is going to stand up in court and say, I was so misled by the mediator that I allowed my client to sign an agreement without him really properly consenting to it. I mean, in reality, it's going to be pretty bizarre. The second hurdle and one was most important as far as I was concerned, materiality had to be judged objectively. And that meant not an assertion by the party that it was material, but by an independent third party, usually a judge to whom the application is being made in the relevant jurisdiction to set aside the settlement agreement. And that's an important safeguard because it is a, a third party unconnected with the dispute, who is having to judge whether or not the allegation is the materiality was material. And again, we had hours and hours of argument as to whether it should be substantive. Somebody said it should be any, some people said um, egregious, but materiality was, uh, material was one that was finally settled upon. And the last, and perhaps the most important hurdle that any person seeking to set out there the agreement must overcome is that they must establish to the tribunal's satisfaction that the alleged breach or failure vitiated their consent. And once that was accepted by the delegates sitting around that boardroom table, chuffing sandwiches and delicacies from the New York delicatessen around the corner, then the Obligations of those delegates, which had to have the safeguards in the convention were fulfilled. And the fears of those experienced mediators that this was a, an easy option for somebody to resolve an agreement they had second thoughts about after it was signed were also satisfied. Because we all recognize that the hurdles were possibly in reality impossible to achieve. And thus we have the protection which those governments wanted and the safeguards that the experienced mediators realized were necessary. 
And so that's how those two articles came to be accepted by uh, the working group on the Friday and ratified the following session in Vienna the next year. And thus they are in there. And therefore the criticisms held against me by the particular arbitrator concerned when you looked at the convention, perhaps on second thoughts, might have been misplaced. I hope so. But what is the effect as far as the UK is concerned? Article 6 of the convention relates to confidentiality. Unless otherwise agreed by the parties, all information relating to the mediation, including if relevant, the settlement agreement, shall be kept confidential by those involved in the mediation, except where disclosure is required by the law, or as referred to in Article 8, Paragraph 4. Article 8.4 enables the settlement agreement to be used as evidence that it was the result of mediation and, of course, to enable its enforcement. Now, how is that going to apply? Robert mentioned California. Those are familiar with the jurisdiction in California. The Civil Evidence Act in California prohibits any mention of anything that passes between the parties or the mediator in a mediation. Even to the extent that one particular case, Castle, which is notorious, where the attorney got his client to sign a blank agreement saying, don't worry, I know what you want and I'll fix it, just sign here and you can go home. And he then proceeded to do a deal which was completely against his client's interests. And an action by the client to sue his attorney for malpractice was simply thrown out on the grounds that you can't prove it because we can't hear evidence about what went on in the mediation. And that's an absurd extension of the confidentiality principle. But let's turn to the UK. One of the banes of my life is the a seeming failure by some courts to recognize that mediation is a special resolution process, which is very much sui generis. Lord Briggs, when he was Lord Justice, wrote a splendid article for the Solicitor's Journal, in which he absolutely nailed the essential and quintessential difference between arbitration, negotiation, and mediation. And whereas successive courts have dismissed mediations merely assisted without prejudice negotiations, they have overlooked this one element, and that is that the mediator uniquely sees each side privately and confidentially. And that's when each party conveys their fears, their expectations, their wishes, their circumstances, which they don't want the other side to know, which will help the mediator to help the parties to a settlement they may otherwise not have achieved. That doesn't happen in a, an assisted without prejudice negotiation, because the negotiations, as we all know, parties sit in their particular castle and negotiate from their position of strength. It's the mediator who alone is apprised of this information. And that confidentiality ought to be protected. We don't have a mediation act in the UK. We don't have any regulations for the conduct of mediation other than the European Code of Conduct, which I helped draft and which fortunately is, hasn't been withdrawn, nor could it be, even though the UK has withdrawn from the European Directive on Mediation. And so we have the European Code of Conduct, and every panel of arbitration, of, of mediation, I'm sorry, has its own rules by which the mediator who is appointed under those rules has to apply. And of course, experienced mediators will have a mediation agreement between themselves and the parties, which sets out the basis upon which you will mediate. And confidentiality, impartiality, is always essential elements of any such agreement. So how would evidence be introduced by any party seeking to take advantage of 51E or F? I expect the UK may well say, well, this is one of those exceptions to the without prejudice negotiation rules set out by the Court of Appeal there's a whole list of exceptions 
including in one particular decision, uh, in the interest of justice, or to, to the overriding objective of our civil procedure rules. It, it, it is insufficient if the Singapore Convention is going to mean anything at all. We have got to grapple, as do indeed every jurisdiction who is going to implement the Convention, has to grapple with this apparent dichotomy between the confidentiality privileges, I prefer to call it, of the mediation process and the ability of a party to draw attention. Now, if it's a failure to abide by standards, the standards are objectively judged. But if it's a failure which initiates the consent, the only person who can properly give evidence of the vitiation of their consent is the party themselves. And one's only got to pose the question to realize the difficulties that may occur if the jurisdiction in which they are seeking to enforce it, or rather set aside the agreement, is based upon that confidentiality. So there's a little teaser for everybody and for governments wanting to uh, introduce it. And lastly, Article 13, save for intentional wrongdoing, the parties waive to the full extent remitted under the applicable law, any claim against the mediator based on any act or omission in connection with the mediation. But again, if you link that with Article 5.1 EMF, it means it's got to be objectively judged, material, and vitiating the consent. Well, that's a very brief introduction to how those two articles came to be drafted. Um, as yet, I know of no jurisdiction where they've been tested, and I suspect, and please God, they never will be, because I think the problems that will arise are going to be insuperable for the parties who wish to take advantage of them. I'm very happy to discuss any questions anybody has about those two articles or any other part of the, of the uh, convention, as I was there for three sessions of the working group, uh, drafting each section and line by line the arguments that went on and the solution which was as i said don't forget is a compromise and don't forget it applies only to international commercial disputes nothing domestic and so the usual kind of what about the little old lady being taken advantage of that is not what we're talking about thank you michelle uh, splendid. Now, can I just take the floor over to Eunice? Uh, would you like to just mention about what's happening with regard to the Singapore side of things and an update from there? Thank you, Eunice. Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Shobna. And it's a pleasure to be here alongside Robert and Michelle. I'll speak a little bit on the Singapore perspective and take the chance to maybe speak to a few of the questions that have come in, which might lead us quite nicely to the panel discussion later. So one of the questions that came in was from uh, Gerard, which related to whether we needed the Singapore Convention. And, you know, was it that, uh, would it be commonly used or is it a just in case type of provision? So I'd like to share a case in Singapore, which, which could illustrate the need for the convention. Uh, this was a 2016 case that was decided in our high court, where you see uh, parties had actually in the uh, Zhou Shan City Intermediate Court in China, been referred for mediation, uh, got a mediation agreement, and had that uh, recorded as a mediation paper under Chinese law. Um, the plaintiff wanted to enforce against assets in Singapore and came to Singapore to attempt to enforce this mediation paper as a summary judgment. Uh, the plaintiff succeeded initially before the assistant registrar, um, but on appeal to the High Court, uh, the High Court said that there were tribal issues of whether or not this mediation paper could be enforced outside of China. And so it is, you know, back to a full trial uh, for the parties on this issue. So, um, Gerard, maybe this illustrates to you how particularly in international cases, there might be a need for the Singapore Convention. Although I suppose Michelle is right that, you know, in practice where people have uh, lawyered up with teams, uh, this might not happen very frequently. Um, I also wanted to speak to 
the questions raised by Thomas and Chitra regarding the method of enforcement of mediated settlement agreements. So the convention leaves this open, right? As does the New York Convention when it comes to arbitral agreements as well. So it really is up to individual states. Now, Singapore has ratified the convention and we have done so by enacting uh, what we call the Singapore Convention on Mediation Act. So just to share uh, from our perspective how our government has chosen to uh, provide a procedure for enforcement, uh, we have done so uh, through this act by allowing applications to be made to the High Court uh, for recording of uh, these settlement agreements as an order of the court. Okay, and the grounds for refusing application, these are mirrored, they follow what is provided for in the convention. Uh, the act provides also for potential setting aside uh, of the order of court, right? Um, deals with parallel applications or claims in the same vein as the convention itself does, uh, provides for the rules and regulations to be made and reproduces the convention in the schedule. Right? So it, it, for us, it was a very straightforward procedure. Um, there was this is, may or may not be the method that the UK uses, you know, enforcement as an order of by recording as an order of court. Uh, but in Singapore, there mm -hmm. was some um, uh, kind of a precedent for this because we do have a mediation act in Singapore, which does allow even before the Singapore Convention was enacted, the recording of uh, mediated settlement agreements as orders of court, right? So I hope that addresses uh, or provides one perspective on one way uh, the enforcement can be carried out. Uh, and then I wanted to share a little bit of the impact uh, of the Singapore Convention in Singapore, which was also uh, you know, something that I see Dat Pan has, has uh, asked whether or not uh, having the convention has increased international commercial mediation cases. Uh, from the Singapore perspective, we can see that uh, we have faced an increase in case load for our uh, institution, the Singapore International Mediation Center. Um, since the convention was enacted, uh, they have uh, you know, faced an increasing case load. Um, and we have also quite significant developments in the law pertaining to mediation since then. I'll just highlight a few of them. Um, this one, uh, the recent changes to our rules of court was quite significant. There was a new order introduced to provide for a party to any proceedings having the duty to consider amicable resolution of the party's dispute before the commencement and during the course of any action or even an appeal. You know? So this is an ongoing obligation that now uh, you know, parties have to consider amicable resolution and the rules further empower the court to order parties to attempt to resolve their dispute by amicable resolution, including mediation. And the consequence of not doing so, well, that will be taken care of uh, in terms of costs. Yeah. Another interesting development in the law uh, is this case in Singapore, which for the first time, uh, we had the High Court uh, enforce a media, an agreement to mediate by ordering specific performance. Right? So this is quite a novel thing. Um, we have had cases where courts might have ordered stay, the stay of court proceedings right, for parties to attend mediation, but this one was one where the court actually decided to order specific performance. And one of the considerations by the court I'll let you sort of glance through the slide yourself, but I wanted to zoom down straight to the last point. The court noted that there was a trend toward the promotion of amicable dispute resolution. And this was one of the factors the court considered in whether or not it was just an equitable to order specific performance. So I just wanted to end off by um, showing you the, that because of the impact of the convention, and I mean, I suppose Singapore is also uh, taking advantage of the fact that the convention is named after Singapore, right? Um, to promote itself as a you know dispute resolution hub with a complete suite of services, right? 
for international disputes, whether it's arbitration, litigation, or mediation, there are established institutions where mediation um, can be uh, filed. And also we have the Singapore International Mediation Institute, which sets the standards for mediation uh, in Singapore. And, you know, Michelle alluded to, you know, how difficult it might be um, to kind of Put a finger on what standards you know you could set for mediators. Um, our Singapore International Mediation Institute has uh, sort of tried to take a lead on that uh, and recently they have issued uh, what they call a core competency framework for mediators addressing aspects of mediation knowledge and process management, party management and mediation content management which uh, is also quite uh, unique uh, at this point in time. So um, I'll, I'll share these slides uh, with, with the Secretariat to share with all of you later on. Um, and I do look forward to a good discussion around the convention. Uh, back to you, Shopna, so we have time for some questions and answers. Thank you, Eunice. I know we're running out of time, but I think we're all going to extend it because it seems to be very exciting and we've got quite some activation here. So one of the questions, I'll take it from the start, um, Abdul Sattar says, it seems that in the arbitration context where the settlement is achieved through a mediation process during the arbitration process itself, uh, it might it might better it might be better to record the settlement as a consent award uh, to benefit from the new york regime rather than a settlement agreement for the benefit of the singapore regime uh, would you would the panel agree from the enforcement perspective I mean, my view is yes, <laughs> I think it's better <laughs> to get the award and the new york convention but what's the other member uh, panel view on this yes Where michelle I think that you'll find that the Singapore um, have already enacted a procedure whereby you start an arbitration, it's immediately adjourned for mediation, and once the mediation, if it's successful, it goes back to the arbitration and then becomes a binding award. So they've already thought through that scheme to implement it before the convention itself was drafted. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shobna, if I, I may, I, I would just say that uh, before the Singapore Convention came into force, um, as part of a, a special edition of the Singapore Academy of Law Journal, I, I wrote a piece on uh, enforcing mediated settlement agreements without the convention, right? And of course, one of the methods would be, um, you know, if you sort of uh, using use a hybrid process, right, and have that recorded as an arbitral award. Of course, the numbers, in terms of number of countries who have signed and ratified the New York Convention, you compare that with the Singapore one, the numbers seem to suggest, you know, what you said, a resounding sort of yes, right, as a matter of practicality. But there are some risks that uh, parties might also consider when they do that, right, when they start combining um, processes. So Michelle alluded to this uh, ARP met ARP, meaning you start arbitration, pause it, and then you know, do your mediation, go back to arbitration um, that we have introduced in the Singapore International Arbitration Centre and Mediation Centre. Um, but many other creative ways exist, uh, including NEDARP, right, where you don't start the arbitration first, but that may give you that risk that when you start an arbitration only for the purpose to record your mediated settlement as an award, that might be a problem, right? Because under the New York Convention, there must be some dispute that you resolve um, in arbitration. So some additional food for thought. Yes, no, thanks for that, uh, Eunice. Um, right, so the next question we got from Gillian Lamara, um, another uh, our mediator here is, um, there has been a debate over whether the convention applies to mediated settlement agreements in investor state cases. What does the panel think? So what do you think about investment um, in investor state cases? Because there has been this increased uh, idea of mediation available on that. I think it fits all right. What do, what do you say, <laughs> Michelle? Uh -huh. I, I think Robert. in fact there's, there's, a, there's a working group already working on invested state disputes and de de trying to devise uh, an agreed mechanism rather like the Singapore Convention or International Commercial Mediation Disputes. So um, 
I, I think that the, it's, it's, it's an ongoing, it's a work in progress at the moment for the UN. Yes, um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, what Michelle had to say about that because the, the um, preamble to convention refers to recognizing the value for international trade. And I could see there's an argument both ways. One could certainly argue, well, one's not talking about investment in state and talking about trade between different companies in different, different uh, countries. Um, short now, I'd also like to add another uh, point to that, which is that although the Singapore Convention doesn't define the word commercial, um, but if you look at the companion uh, model law, uh, there is a uh, definition for commercial in this uh, model law, uh, put in a little footnote, footnote two, and it does say the term commercial should be given a wide interpretation so as to cover matters arising from all relationships of a commercial nature, whether contractual or not. And then it goes on to list various things that might be considered relationships of a commercial nature, such as the yeah, trans trade transaction for the supply or exchange of goods or services, distribution agreement, construction of works, so on and so forth, right? So I suspect it is something that is open for discussion, especially with now investor state, um, you know, agreements. They, they could take different forms, right? Where the com where the, the countries incorporate a company and that's the company that works with the investor. So I think it all depends. <laughs> Agree totally because we've got clarification as to um, what it doesn't include. So what, what what's excluded, what type of certain disputes are expressly excluded from the New York Convention, such as consumer di disputes, disputes arising out of transactions engaged by one of the parties as a, a personal family or household, or if it's a family dispute, inheritance disputes and employment disputes. But it's quite wide on the rest of the other areas. Um, Right, so the next question is, oh, I think I'll put this one first. Away. Why, uh, maybe uh, Michelle, you might like to answer this, but why were the EU against the convention? I don't know if it's against the convention, but <laughs> I think it's probably... Uh, they they wanted to be a, mo a model law on the basis that uh, actually a model law is all well and good, but nobody pays any attention to it. Uh, and they were also drafting their own a convention to enforce uh, agreements uh, uh, completed within the EU itself. And they didn't want this to cut across it. I think that was the basis of it. Uh, it's interesting that the EU still haven't ratified the Singapore Convention. And don't forget, of course, the EU consists of 26 different nations, each of which have to agree. And that is also a problem where each party has their own agenda. Absolutely. Um, so uh, uh, another question here, and probably Robert can answer this. Um, England already has and uh, will enforce a settlement agreement in accordance with the rules of procedure. It would be helpful to understand in what respect the convention requires any change in the law here. Um, if, if the convention was included a provision requiring countries to introduce a summary process for recognition, it would be more obvious. So what's your view, Robert, on that? Well, I think the convention was giving considerable discretion to the mm. country of enforcement as to how it does it. And that's why to deal with the second uh, <laughs> sentence first, uh, it wasn't specific, specified in it. And it's really a question of how the Minister of Justice thinks it's best to deal with it, whether by an act, whether by rules of court or, or what. We'll just have to wait and see. Yes, and Eunice, you've already got it. You've got a process already in place for that. Yes, we've chosen the method of, uh, by way of order of court, yeah. yeah. And of course, in, in, as far as England is concerned, you would have to have live proceedings in order to a be able to and register a settlement agreement as an, order, as an order of the court, usually by a Tomlin order. I don't think you could simply apply to the court and say, look, we've reached a settlement, can you please make it an order of the court? Because there's no list between the parties 
Over which the court, the court have jurisdiction. Well, you'll have to you'll have to initiate proceedings as a breach of contract, won't you? Because that's a contract, and go through that process. So then you've got the as, as I as I said at the beginning, the the difficulties and the t how time consuming and expensive it is. Right, and particularly if there's a, the other parties in a different jurisdiction, get leave to serve outside the jurisdiction, and then you have arguments as Robert was quite saying, with in that jurisdiction, that their courts would enforce it. So it, I think it needs um, a, a special act to enforce it, the same way as you enforce it. Um, right, I think I've got a question here and it says, uh, I, I don't think, it, I'll, I'll just read out the question. It mentions that what can the parties do when a settlement agreement emerges after a formal mediation took place and seemingly failed? Uh, should they still try rely on the Singapore Convention? Well, I think if they already entered into a settlement agreement, it's it hasn't failed. But I don't know what your view on this, <laughs> unless you know one of the circumstances, obviously. I suppose this is one of those scenarios we see commonly where on the day you convene the mediation, the settlement agreement may not be signed, right? But separately, mm -hmm. parties continue negotiating and they eventually arrive at a settlement. So the question really would be whether or not we can still treat this as a mediated settlement agreement, right? Uh, or, or not, yeah. Michelle or Robert, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. Well, I can tell you what my practice is, if that happens, Eunice, and I'm sure it's the same as yours. Um, I urge the lawyers to draw up binding heads of agreement and include all the essential terms of the agreement and include an undertaking by all the parties to enter into and give effect to all documents and agreements necessary to implement the binding heads of terms. And one's experience of lawyers, the immutable law of nature is that no lawyer can resist amending another lawyer's draft in the event of a dispute between the lawyers as to the need for or the content of such documents or agreements, then appoint me as arbitrator to decide it as arbitrator. So I'm not deciding any of the issues because they've been decided. All that I'm deciding is a dispute as to how to give effect to those particular issues uh, in an agreement. Robert, do you want to add anything? Or <laughs> Right, the uh, next question is, um, in the UK, the vast majority of mediated settlement agreements are complied with, so don't need enforcing. Is this the same with international ones? And if so, is the Singapore Convention commonly used? I think Eunice, you answered that quite well there. But uh, to what extent is it A, actually used in practice and B, only a, a reassuring just-in-case tool to encourage participants to use mediation? So I think we kind of answered that as the real reason for uh, the purpose of having this convention. But anybody wants to add anything extra to that? No. Uh, Kishore there says, um, is it really mandatory for each and every country to sign and ratify the Singapore Convention if they claim that mediation is already practiced in their societies and legal systems? So, um, well, I think it's principally, I think what you mentioned about the scope of the um, Singapore Convention. Um, Robert, what's your view on that? Well, you can't enforce a convention unless uh, another country has uh, signed and ratified it. You can't enforce it in that country, it's as simple as that. But I suppose it's not like the seat of arbitration where... Uh, no, it's a entirely different yeah. animal. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, you can't, if they haven't... Um, got the uh, ratified ratified the convention I suppose you can't you can't enforce it in that legal system but I suppose if a settlement agreement has been done by two parties in that uh, state they can enforce it in another uh, state that's ratified the convention I assume it's it goes back to what you're saying in Vienna and that is that most lawyers if they know what they're doing and they do is to make sure that there's a provision in the settlement agreement as to which jurisdiction it shall be enforced and by which court. And so 
I'm glad to know that uh, debt funds jurisdiction um, have um, mediation as part of their legal system. And so that legal system would obviously be ideal for enforcing the settlement agreement. But if it's international, you have to worry about what Robert has drawn attention to, and that is a different state, a different jurisdiction, and different enforcement principles. So the Singapore Convention would then come into play. And I think I'll just answer this out loud, but I think we've already answered this. Has the ratification of the Singapore Convention considerably increased international commercial mediation cases in the 11 uh, ratifying countries? Um, I think Eunice, you've kind of answered this, but what's I could your for one of the ratifying countries? Yeah, one not of, all eleven. One of the <laughs> yes. So I think in Singapore, what's your view on that? I think you mentioned that yes, um, we definitely have seen that an increase in the number of international cases. So let's just hope that um, UK gets it ratified and in force as soon as possible. Um, right, I think the last question, I think we already answered it. In terms of enforcement, which con convention serves better, the New York Convention or the Singapore Convention? We already answered that one. Um, so I think that's the end of the question. So now I'll just pass the floor over. I want to thank all of you for a wonderful, insightful session. Thank you uh, too. And I think thank I'll you. pass the floor off to uh, Sapna um, to just do any kind of closing remarks. Thanks Shobna, that was such a stimulating discussion. I felt very disappointed when you said that um, you were thanking the speakers and it was an end. I really enjoyed it, it was so interesting. Uh, enjoyed uh, Robert's very crisp and clear description of the convention itself. Enjoyed Michelle sharing his views on uh, the exceptions to enforcement and weaving in his travels to Vienna and New York in inclement weather um, and sort of side meals and negotiations. Uh, I loved the phrase he shared, which was that all conventions come together on compromise. We really appreciated um, that insider view of the negotiations over the convention. And thanks to Eunice for giving us the Singapore perspective, where it really is fair to say that the convention has had a significant impact in leading to an upward trend in the use of mediation supported by new um, court rules which she mentioned but also just a general interest uh, within the dispute resolution community in Singapore uh, and within the ecosystem that we have in encouraging mediation and thinking more about different ADR tools. So thank you, all of the excellent speakers. Thank you, Shobna, for your moderation. Thank you to our audience. They were excellent questions. Really enjoyed uh, hearing the questions and our expert panel answers. So thank you very much. Um, I feel that there's still more to discuss and I'm wondering if Karina and I need to discuss doing a phase two webinar to cover all the topics that we didn't have a chance to get to, but I'll take that offline with Karina. For now, again, thank you everyone. Thanks to our audience. My last remaining request, please, is um, we'll have a feedback form appearing on your screen now with a QR code. If you in the audience would be so kind as to fill out the two minute survey, it's very useful feedback uh, for both Singapore and London branch that we can make sure that we keep putting on uh, excellent thought leadership events, which are of interest both to our members and non-members. So please fill out the survey. Thanks again, everyone, and have a nice rest of the day. A uh, nice afternoon or nice evening, wherever you joined from. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure seeing so many good friends and colleagues. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Shabada. And do something. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye bye.